It's so good to have you in the house of the Lord. And we are richly blessed. And while we're finding Psalms 91, we take a moment and welcome you, our internet family. We're so thankful to have you tonight. You are a blessing to us as always. Some of you consider us your church and we're deeply honored that you tune in with us and you follow with us and study with us. We're greatly privileged to share God's word. Thank you for your love, your prayer, and your support. Thank you for helping us, praying for us, planting seeds of finances. And as we study tonight, remember these words from Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We expect faith to grow exceedingly while we listen, study, and grow in the word. Be blessed tonight. Study with us Psalms 91. Psalms 91. And uh, we pray that you've had a great week and a good day thus far and a good time in the Lord. And you're blessed of the Lord. Tonight, seed of Abraham in Christ, blessed and highly favored. That's who you are and what God says about you. So tonight, we'll just read with understanding Psalms 91, verse 1 through 16, then come back to verse 2 tonight. All right, let's read with understanding. Let these words pierce and penetrate our heart. David writes and said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, that is to be in Christ. He's talking about me. He's talking about you. He's talking about us. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Our text tonight, I will say of the Lord. He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers. Under His wings shalt thou trust. And His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth in noonday. Listen to this good news. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. You're the last man or woman of God standing. That's you. A thousand at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You're still standing. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked because you've made the Lord my refuge. David here talking about himself in the light of the old covenant. You've made my refuge even the Most High, your habitation. How would you do that? Well, if you read 1 John 4, 15 and 16, he tells you by confession and connection through faith in the gospel, God becomes your habitation. I live in God. God lives in me. I live in Christ. Christ lives in me. Let's shout tonight. I live in God. God lives in me. I live in Christ. Christ lives in me. He has become my dwelling place, my habitation. No evil shall befall thee, neither any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he, the Father, shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. So we're very thankful tonight. We always have angelic ministry and help by our side. I'm always aware of these two giant gentlemen that are with me. I can sense the one on the right hand much more sometimes. But they're always there. I've seen them in my spirit. They're there to attend to me and help me. They've been sent forth as ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. God assigns every one of us guardian angels that help us and minister to us more than we realize. And there's both old and new covenant precedent for angelic ministry. In Acts 27, Paul said, An angel of the Lord hath appeared this night unto me and said. And, of course, with this message comes the angelic ministry. And so we have angels that dwell with us and help us and minister to us. And he says, now listen, he shall give his angels charge over thee. They keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. That stone could be interpreted as the law. And of course, the angels could also be interpreted as fivefold ministry to help you overcome the stumbling that occurs when we don't understand the law. And then he says about your feet, he's talking about your walk, your feet, you shall tread upon the lion and adder. That means your enemies are under your feet. Romans 16, 20, they're bruised under your feet. Luke 10, 19, you'll tread upon serpents and scorpions. Luke 10, 19, you'll tread upon serpents and scorpions. You will tread. The word tread is the Hebrew word that means a well-worn path. This is a way of life. This is my lifestyle. I'm always victorious. I'm triumphant in Christ. 
You will tread upon the lion and adder and the young lion. Remember, the young lion represents poverty. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. The young lions, Samson ran a young lion like a baby goat. And the dragon, the full expression of demonic activity in the book of Revelation 12, you will trample under feet. That means Satan's best and biggest expression is under your feet. And you are a, a victor more than a conqueror and overcomer. Blessed of the Lord. You are victorious. God always gives you the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, you will tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and dragon, you will trample under feet. Then he switches to the Garden of Gethsemane because he, now this he is Jesus very clearly, because he has set his love upon me. And he did that in the Garden of Gethsemane to the fullest extent. He laid down everything he was and took up what we were. Therefore, I deliver him. He was laid in the lowest pit by a mutual agreement. God delivered him from that pit, set him on high. Jesus reigning tonight, ruling tonight. He's enthroned in sovereign glory. Jesus reigns because he has known my name. And if you study John 17, 26, he just simply says, Now I have declared thy name. And Jesus was able in his ministry to declare the name of God. And then God declared the name of Jesus. And now you and I have this great privilege of knowing the name of Jesus. It's all in the name of Jesus. Whatever you need, whatever you desire, it's all in the name of Jesus because he's known my name. And then it switches to he, the corporate body, he, head and body, shall call upon me. I will answer him. That's you and me in our prayer life. I will be with him in trouble. That's head and body. I will deliver him and I will honor him. And the word honor here is the Hebrew word. You're familiar with it. It's kabod. You remember, Ichabod means the glory is departed. Ich is a departing, and Kabod is glory, a departing glory. He said, I will honor him or put my glory upon him. The body of Christ is to carry the glory of God. John 17, 22, Jesus said, The glory you've given to me, Father, I have given to them. And then with long life will I satisfy him, the corporate body, and show him my salvation. My, and the Hebrew reads, Yahshua, my salvation. What a rich psalm of protection. Now we're studying this thought of Abraham's blessing in the earth. We call this the promise of the life that now is. And God told Abraham, he said, listen, I'll be perfect righteousness to you without the law. He did not give Abraham the law. Perfect righteousness. I'm your righteousness. Number two, don't be afraid of anything. I give you peace and rest. I'm your freedom from this dimension called the fall. I'll give you rest, peace and rest, liberty from the curse. And number three, he said, I am your shield. When Adam transgressed, he made the earth a dangerous place for man to be. There is much death, decay, decline, and disruption and corruption in the earth realm. But God said, I'll be your shield. So we have a bold confession tonight that I have a shield. The Lord God is a sun and shield. He gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Psalms 84, 11. And then in Psalms 5, 12, he will encompass us as a, a favor with his favor like a shield. He'll encompass us. So tonight I have divine protection. I expect divine protection. I enforce that with God's help. So now he just simply says, I will say of the Lord in verse 2, he is my refuge. My fortress and my God in him will I trust. My refuge, my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Now, last week we started this and we're using five words here that begin with the letter W. The first is your will. Notice David said, I will. Now, my question for you tonight is, what do you will? You have a will. God could never be satisfied if he made man apart from his will. God's most priceless gift to you is your will. And God allows you to choose some things. And it's very important you understand this. There's some things that God will not allow you to choose. You can't choose whether Jesus is Lord. That's already decided. You can't choose whether Jesus' blood would be on the mercy seat to heal you and deliver you and bless you and set you free. That's already decided. But what you can choose is whether you receive that. Now, the question is not, is Jesus Lord? The question is, is Jesus your Lord? Because he's Lord whether I choose or not, but he can only be my Lord through choice. So there's great truth here in the sovereignty of God and the submission of man's will working together. 
You see, God has made choice, and now God allows me to choose, and God is love, and God will never be satisfied until He is chosen and trusted. You must choose Him and trust Him, and that's what satisfies love. If God had put Adam in the garden without choice, He would have been a kept pet. That's what He would have been, a very advanced pet, but He would have been kept. Without choice, even though He would have been in a plush garden, He would have had the tree of life and all those trees and all that blessing and all that life in God's image, in God's glory, yet His heart would have never been unveiled till He had a choice. You see, my choices unveil my heart. God still anoints choices, and you know, you can make a few right choices, and your life excel by leaps and bounds. A few wrong choices, and you could end up in prison or dead. Just a couple of wrong choices could send your life in a way that you, unbelievable pain, a couple of right choices could send your life into unbelievable prosperity. You just have to learn to listen to God and let God lead you and guide you and learn to make wise choices. It's very important. There's no way we can overestimate the importance of what I choose. God allows me choices. Behold, I set before you death and life, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you and your seed may live. That you may love the Lord God, obey His voice, cleave unto Him. He is thy life and the length of thy days. So your will is involved in this. Notice David starts verse 2 by saying, I will. My choice. And tonight... We're going to talk about words which will follow right off Sunday. And you know I never plan ahead very far. I didn't realize that was going to happen. But this will work right in alignment with what we talked about Sunday. There's either a miracle in your mouth or a mess in your mouth. <laughs> There's either a blessing or a burden in your mouth. And David said, I will say. And you know from Sunday, if you were here and you listened, your words have great impact on your life. Jesus said, by your word you shall be justified, by your word you shall be condemned. The Lord Jesus said that. Jesus said, whosoever can have whatsoever, he saith in Mark eleven twenty three. 23, whosoever, whatsoever. Jesus said that, the head of the church. And then the Bible is very clear throughout the entire Bible that this whole creation was framed with words, and words are an integral and central part of creation and of man. The thing that distinguishes you from the rest of the creation is you have a will and you have the right to choose and speak your words. Hung by the tongue. I've been there a few times. How about you? Loose lips still sink ships. And so I'm believing God that my mouth is sanctified. And when Isaiah got in the presence of God in Isaiah chapter 6, he just simply said, I'm a man of unclean lips. The presence of God just has this way of unveiling our speech. And then he said, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So God tonight, help us communicate this truth with wisdom and understanding so we know how to talk in agreement with God. Because if God's saying one thing and you're saying another, you're going to end up with what you say, not what God said. Now, people don't understand that. And that's a very simple statement, but boy, has it proven true in my life. If God says he's my strength and I keep talking about how weak I am, I'm going to end up in the frailty of my own weakness. But if I will take Joel 3.10 and just practice that one verse, let the weak say, I am strong. Even though my condition is weak, God said, prophesy, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. So then when I begin to practice that, God comes in and begins to work with my faith and strengthen me, and He becomes my strength. I'll never have what God said if I keep saying what God didn't say. Simple, basic, base, 101 study of faith. I can never have what God said in my life if I keep saying what God didn't say. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without coverage. Just be content with such things as you have. For he has said, notice he has said, he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now we put all of our confidence in that. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Jesus cannot lie. He cannot fail. So Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now I know I grew up under preachers that tormented me with this idea that if I didn't do right, God was going to leave me. 
And a lot of children are taught from the time they're very young. Now, don't you be ugly and don't you do ugly because Jesus don't like ugly and he doesn't want to be around ugly and Jesus will leave you if you are ugly or do ugly. Instead of teaching a child, he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now, we don't want any child to be ugly or act ugly or think ugly or talk ugly or do ugly. We don't want that. But Jesus is not basing his presence in my life based on what I do and don't do. It's based on what he said. See, this is covenant faith. Covenant faith based on what he said, not what I do. He said, now I didn't say that. He said that. Matthew 28, 20, he says it again. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So thank you, you never leave me nor forsake me. I thank you, your word is true, it does not lie, it cannot fail. You'll never leave me, never forsake me. Never, he said, never. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, So that we may boldly say. And here's the concept of confession. Is that God talks and then I talk. You don't ever go first. Be wise, be smart. Some people might think I'm a fool. If I open my mouth, I might confirm their suspicions. It's entirely possible. I've had some people think I was ignorant, but if I keep silent, I learned this a long time ago, and this is a golden revelation. Silence cannot be misquoted. Well, what did Pastor John say? He wouldn't say anything. You mean he didn't say anything? What do you make of that? I don't know. He didn't say anything. But if I open my mouth and start talking, then things are going to come out sooner or later out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. There's going to be issues in my life. So I learned to keep my mouth, keep my life. He has said that we may boldly say, I let him talk. He has said that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Because he's with me, he becomes my helper. So tonight, I'm not without help. I have been told by several people, I do need help. Thank God I have a helper. The Holy Ghost helpeth our infirmities. Romans 8, 26, he takes hold with me against my infirmities. And the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. So it's real simple. God has spoken to you in that written covenant, that word. The Bible is what God is speaking to you. The Bible is God's word to you. That's why I do this all the time. I pick my Bible up and say, this is my Bible. This is God speaking to me. When I pick the Bible up, I, I treat it as though God is standing right in front of me, the Lord Jesus, and I can see him with these eyes, and he's talking to me because he won't say anything out of, out of his heart to me that's not already written in that book. And I treat it that way, so I'm going to align my conversation. I'm going to talk in agreement with God. So here's the way this works. If you want what God has said about you, you have to agree with and say what God said. God told me many years ago, he gave me this, this really strange statement. He said, I've told my people they can have what I say, but my people keep saying what they have. And I wrote that down and I pondered it for several days. I've told my people they can have what I say, but my people keep saying what they have. You might want to write that down and contemplate it. I've told my people they can have what I say. Do you realize that everything that's in Christ in that book that's for now, you can have it. It belongs to you. It, these things are freely given. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with him what? freely give us all things. He gave me Jesus. That's heaven's best. That's the pearl of great price. That's the great treasure. He gave me Jesus. When he gave me Jesus, anything that he would withhold now would make that more valuable than Jesus. Jesus is the priceless treasure of all of heaven and the earth and the ages, and he gave the priceless treasure of the heavens and the earth and the ages to me. Therefore, everything's freely given, Romans 8.32. Romans 8.32, he'll freely give us all things. God said to me many years ago, I've told my people they can have what I say, but my people keep saying what they have. They keep talking about their sickness, their weakness, their arthritis, their lumbago, their, their struggle, their frustrations, their aggravations. And when we do that, we only compound the problem. Now, I know this is not going to make you shout tonight, but you're only compounding your own problem. You're making matters worse with your own mouth. If nothing else, just be quiet until you can get some faith in you. Just shut up and be quiet. 
and let God deal with your heart so you can bring something to pass from the heart of faith. Now, tonight, I want you to go with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. Let's turn there, Romans chapter 10. I want to talk to you about these three words, and I doubt we'll have time to deal with all this tonight. There's too much here. But Romans chapter 10, we start with the subject of confession. And Christianity is also called the great agreement or the great confession, for the word confession means agreement. And there's a great truth here that the body of Christ has missed because instinctively, when people hear the word confession, they think of confessing their sins. But we haven't really properly understood how to confess our sins. The word confession means to agree with. I agree with God about my sins. My sins are on the tree in Christ. I've not really confessed my sins when I'm only confessing what I've done. That's not really the confession of sin. The confession of my sin is that He bore my sin away. So let's shout tonight, if it's on the tree, it's not on me. And if He took it into the grave, I don't have to be a slave anymore. I don't have to be a slave. So Paul writes here, Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. I bear them record they have a zeal of God and for God but not according to knowledge. So that just zeal is not enough. Zeal is good. Thank God. If you got a choice to be dead or alive, choose life. If I'd rather have a dead praise or a living praise, I'd rather have life-giving praise, wouldn't you? If I'm going to preach, I want to be alive. So it's good to have zeal, but you need some knowledge with zeal. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and there's probably not a subject in all the Bible that people are more ignorant of than God's righteousness. Notice it's God's righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness. Now, if you're doing that, my suggestion is stop. You don't have to establish your own righteousness. Even if you do, you know what it ends up being? It ends up being filthy rags in the sight of God. My righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. I have no righteousness of my own. And Paul prayed that he would not even have the righteousness which is of the law. In Philippians 3, 9, Paul said, Lord, I don't even want the righteousness which is of the law, but that which is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that I may be found in Him. That I may be found in Him. So don't go about to establish your own righteousness. Receive the gift of God's righteousness. Have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. So here's the question tonight. Have you submitted yourself to the righteousness of God? Let Jesus be your righteousness. Jesus is my standing with God. Plus, minus nothing, Jesus is my right standing with God. I stand in the presence of a holy and a just and almighty God who is holy beyond my wildest thought, and I stand in His presence without guilt, shame, fear, or condemnation because Jesus is my righteousness. It's non-negotiable. Jesus is my righteousness. And He makes it very clear in verse 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So I believe tonight Jesus Christ died and rose again, sprinkled my heart with the blood, washed my sins away, and tonight I'm clean, holy, and thank God there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which does those things shall live by them. And what that means is there are Ten Commandments. And then there are another 603 added, 613 Commandments. And if you're going to be right by the law, you got to keep every one of them. For example, tonight, if you have on mixed fabric, you broke the law. You ever put on uh, cotton and another blend with cotton, you've broken the law. And if you're guilty of one point, you've broken it all. The law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Once I saw the law, what it is, what it represented, what it demanded of me, I knew I had no hope of me saving myself. Thank God for the law. It concluded me under sin, convinced me I was a sinner, and brought me to Christ. It drove me to Christ. But what a Savior I have tonight. What a Savior I have that without that law, He saved me by the work He did. And tonight I'm saved by works. It just wasn't my works. He did the work that saved me, not me. Now the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. David said, I will say. The righteousness which is of faith. So if you're righteous tonight... You have a faith that must talk. It must speak. He says, say not in your heart. Now, what you say in your heart is really what governs your life. Self-talk. The world calls that self-talk. And they teach. If you'll go to like a class that teaches you uh, positive thinking, positive talking, they'll spend a lot of time teaching you self-talk. What you say to yourself. 
Say not in your heart. So there's some things you can't say in your heart. Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. So write the word there, righteousness. Righteousness is Christ coming from above. Jesus came from God's heart through the womb of the Virgin Mary, and that is righteousness speaking. He came in the world, in the earth, through flesh. He came. Jesus is righteous. And who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? The word abyss there in the Greek language, the abyss or the bottomless pit to bring Christ again from the dead. Now there you can see both redemption and resurrection. He died our death, but he went into the bottomless pit and God raised him from the dead. The thing about a bottomless pit is there's no end to the fall. If you were to be in a place where there was no bottom, there'd never be an end to the fall. It would just keep coming. That means Jesus, for three days and three nights, was in the bottomless pit in the sense that there was just no end to the fall. He experienced the fall for three days and three nights. The abyss. Well, I can't say come down because he's already come down. And I can't say get up because thank God he's already gotten up. He's alive. But what saith it? Question mark. Now, what is it? It's the righteousness which is of faith. That I'm right with God. Here's how I start talking. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So Paul preached this. And what's being preached ought to be in your mouth. What's being preached ought to be in your mouth. That if you shall confess, confess with your mouth. And notice this has nothing to do with the confession of sins. The Lord Jesus. And shall believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So now notice this with me, if you will. This righteousness, which is a faith, it comes, and we need a revelation of this word of faith. This word of faith is, I'm righteous by faith and faith alone. This word of faith is the Lord Jesus, him crucified, died, buried, quick, and raised, seated. The Lord Jesus. This is the word of faith. The Lord Jesus is our faith. New covenant faith demands that I look away from myself. If I look at me, I'll never have new covenant faith. If I keep looking at me, I'll, I cannot have new covenant faith looking at me. It couldn't be any clearer in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. New covenant faith demands that I look away from myself and look to the author and finisher of my faith. He who began a good work in me will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. So now this revelation is, is that if I will confess with my mouth, the Lord Jesus. So this revelation centers in the person of the Lord Jesus. It's my confession of who Jesus is to me. What Jesus is to me, what Jesus is to me, is my confession. Do you see that? So the Lord Jesus is my life, Colossians 3, 4. He is my strength, Philippians 4, 13. He is my wisdom, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. He is my righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. My redemption, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. My sanctification, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. And the list through the new covenant is an endless unfolding revelation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your confession of faith should center in the person of Jesus. You boldly say, Jesus is my strength. I boldly say tonight, this is my righteousness talking. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. Christ is my strength, my life, my wisdom. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. So you make sure that you center your confession or you agreeing with God, your words, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Now this part of your confession centers on the life side. Christ died, he suffered, he bore, he took, and he carried everything you were. Praise God, isn't that good news? He took, he bore, he carried, and suffered everything that I was. But now, I believe God raised him from the dead. And he's not bearing, he's not carrying, he's not bearing everything I was. Now, he's bearing the image of the heavenly and the glory of the Father. That's who Jesus is. So I believe God raised him from the dead. I believe in a risen Savior. I boldly say tonight, Jesus is alive and alive forever, and Christ lives in me. That is my confession. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth 
confession is made unto salvation. Now, let me show you how this works practically. Your confession is the person, the provision, and the power of everything God's given to you and done for you in Christ. It is those realities that are centered in Christ. When I say, Jesus died my death, that is my confession. When I say, Christ is my life, that is my confession. I'm agreeing with God. All this means is to agree with God. See, God said one thing in His Word, I'm going to say the same thing. When we agree, we can walk together. Remember what God told me. I've told my people they can have what I've said, but they keep saying what they have. So I'm going to quit saying what I have and start saying what He said about me and about you and about us and about the church. So that is my confession of faith. My confession of faith is very deep. It's rich. It speaks of the person of Christ. It speaks of the provision of Christ. Saved and salvation. Now, let, let's just get a definition of those two words. Now, you know that I've got this on my tablet, so I've got the best helps that money can buy. You can't buy any better helps than what's on this tablet. So I'm just going to punch up saved here, and it's, it's cued in to the Greek concordance, and here's what it says. To save means to keep safe, sound, to rescue from danger or destruction. To keep from injury or peril, or to save one from suffering or perishing. To save one suffering from disease, to make well, heal, to restore to health, to preserve one who is in danger, or to rescue. Right here. To save, in the biblical sense, from the eternal damnation or separation from God, or to deliver from the penalty of sin both now and eternally. That's what saved means. So what did God just say? He said, if you will believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. Now, we love the Baptists. Everybody say, God bless the Baptists. I love the Baptists. All my daddy's kin people are Baptists, and I love the Baptists. But the Baptists brainwashed us to the point where saved means born again. Saved means forgiven of your sin, and that's all it means. Now, the Baptists have taught that and 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 taught that until really when you hear the word, say, are you saved to that person? Are you saved? Are, are, well, yes, I'm born again. I'm saved. That's what that means to us. But it's much deeper than that. God said you'll be rescued from danger. You'll be delivered from perishing. You'll be restored to health. You'll be healed. You'll be delivered if you'll believe and say with your mouth the Lord Jesus. So what happens is when I know that, I begin to build expectation. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and I believe in my heart God raised Him from the dead. Therefore, I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. Now, notice this one. This one's even deeper. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession, same word, homo galeo or galeo, is made unto salvation. Now here again, salvation is the Greek word, Soteria. That's the way the Greeks would say it. Soteria. We would say soteria in English. Deliverance, preservation, safety, salvation, deliverance from the molestation of any enemy. I'm reading that right out of a concordance. Deliverance from the molestation of any enemy. In that which is concludes the soul safety and salvation. Messianic salvation, it means future salvation, and it includes, and this is what is written here, it includes all blessings both now and eternally given to us in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything now and eternally. So he just told you that if you will believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved, delivered. And if your heart believes with righteousness and unto this righteousness, Christ is my righteousness, then my mouth confesses or agrees with God unto everything God has done for me, he said, is made unto us salvation. Isn't that powerful? Praise God. So my confession is just simply agreeing with God. Now, I want to show you this, and here's where people trip up. In verse 8, it's your mouth and then your heart. In verse 9, it's your mouth and then your heart. In verse 10, it's your heart and then your mouth. Anytime God changes the order of a thing, He's teaching you something very important. So here's how this works. Every time that you say something, you sow it in your own heart. Every time I say, my words are seeds. 
I could walk up to Harold Vincent tonight and I could literally destroy our fellowship and friendship by words. I could walk up to Harold and say some things that would greatly offend him and hurt him. He could do the same to me. So you understand that every time I say something, I'm sowing. And other people here, and we're sowing into other people. When you speak to a child, a child is a piggy bank. And what you put in them is what you're going to get out of them. That's why I got confidence frantic. I know what was put in that child as a, as a little boy and a young man. I know what's in him. It's got to come out sooner or later. It will come up and come out. It has to. But what we don't realize oftentimes is when we speak, we're sowing stuff in our own heart. So every time I speak concerning myself or the gospel, I'm sowing something into my own heart. And every time I say the Lord Jesus, I'm sowing that into my heart. And every time I say Christ died my death and Christ bore what I was and took what I was and carried what I was. And Christ is risen from the dead and Christ is my life and my sins are washed and I'm redeemed and I'm filled and I'm free and I'm blessed. I'm God anointed, God appointed, God ordained. I'm sowing something into my heart. And eventually, if you'll stay with it, what will happen is you're no longer speaking from what you say, sowing. Now you're speaking out of your harvest, coming out of your heart, and it'll come out of your mouth, and then it'll bring you to full salvation. And people get weary and give up in the sowing it into their own heart because sometimes that's a lengthy process. That can be a lengthy process. But patience is required. It's through faith and patience we inherit the promises of God. So let's go back to my illness now. I can use this because this will illustrate the, the point here very perfectly. Now, when I, that happened to me at the end of 2013, I had taught healing school, preached healing school, prayed for the sick for most of my adult life, all of my adult life pretty much, and all the ministry. So I had a pretty decent foundation of healing. Thank God I'd also taken care of my body to the point where at least I had a pretty good measure of health. I was quite a bit larger than I am now. I'd been bodybuilding, lifting a lot of weights. I was heavy, very strong in my in weights. I was very strong, could do a lot of weights, strong that way. And so the doctor told me, he said, man, I'm just glad you're the age you are, and I'm really glad that you took good care of your body. He said, if you had smoked and drank and dope, he said, you wouldn't survive what you've gone through. You wouldn't have survived. So thank God, God helped me to be a steward of my body and take care of my body. The only thing I abused in my body was my joints. Because every time you tug on those heavy weights, you are putting pressure on your elbows, your shoulders, your hips, your knees, your ankles. You're putting a lot of pressure on your joints. I'm at an age now where I'm realizing I don't want no pressure on my joints. I'm taking care of my joints a whole lot better than I used to. So that being said, uh, I had gallstones that I didn't know I had. And then the gallstone slipped out into pancreatic bile duct, went down in my bile duct, when I ate some meat on Sunday, I tried to eat something on Sunday, then feeling sick for a few days. And with that, just saying, thank you, by your stripes, I'm healed. Then the, the pancreas released its, its acid or its juices to go down in that bile duct. It was stopped up with a, with a gallstone, and the stuff went down in there, and it came back on my pancreas. And those acid and that, that, those juices out of your pancreas will eat right through a table. A doctor told me that. He said, if we took that out of your pancreas and out of the, out of the system of your body, put that in. He said, that stuff, is, that stuff will eat right through wood. He said, that stuff is powerful. He said, it digests meat. You're, you have to have that to eat meat and digest that. So what happened was all those chemicals went back on my pancreas, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there, and when those pancreas, uh, pancreatic chemicals went back on my pancreas, it burned it alive. Now, i got three words to describe that. You ready? Ouch, ouch, ouch. That hurt. I'd had appendicitis. That made appendicitis feel like a Sunday school picnic. Appendicitis is down here. Appendicitis hurts. You ever had your appendix out? That hurts. But this, this was way worse than that. So I doubled over. I fell on the floor, passed out from the pain. The next thing I know, man's beating on my chest, telling me I had a heart attack. Thought I had a heart attack. Teresa called the. Rescue squad, they came to get me, beating on my chest. And I told him, I said, stop beating on my chest. That hurts. And he said, you're having a heart attack. He's down there doing all this stuff to my chest. He said, I'm putting these paddles on you. Let me see. No, it's not my heart. He did an EKG. It wasn't my heart. It went out of rhythm, but it wasn't my heart. Gave me some morphine. That didn't help. Gave me another shot of morphine. Got me to the hospital. And it was a long ordeal. But after I was in there a few days, they told me what had happened and gave me my prognosis, which was now I have no pancreas, none. Dr. Visser comes in my room on January 12th, Sunday morning at 830, and tells me, he gets me by the foot, shakes my foot, and he says, now, John, are you awake? 
can you, can you understand me? Let's talk a little bit. He asked me what day it was and what my name was and where I was. And did I know what happened last night? And I was coherent enough to answer all those questions. He said, and he said on the side of the bed, and he said, I got to talk to you. Your pancreas blew up last night. It's gone. So we're now going to run these tests on your pancreas for the next couple of days. And probably by Wednesday at the latest, we're going to go ahead and we're going to gut you. We're going to cut you, gut you, cut you open and put in a mechanical pancreas, an insulin pump. And you'll never be what you were. You'll never have any quality of life like you had before. You'll be on a digestive enzyme routine. You'll have most of your food out of a blender. And that's the way you're going to live your life. But it beats dying. Now, I knew he told me a story there. He doesn't know this, but nothing beats dying. You know how I know that? Because to die is gain. See, if I'd have went home that day, now, y'all would have missed me, but I'd be doing great. I'd be doing fine. See, if I leave my body tonight, you don't have to mourn for me. Don't. Just only thing I would want you to mourn is that I didn't finish my days in destiny. Don't mourn for me to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So I would be doing fine. To die is gain. And when you realize dying is gain, you lose the fear of it. There's no need to fear dying because dying is gain. We don't fear gain. We fear loss. Can I have a good amen to that? And so I, I heard a voice that said to me, everyone that looketh shall live. And I know that comes from Numbers chapter 21, first 10 verses, serpent on a pole. So I took his left cheek and I looked and God opened up the heavens. I saw a vision in the spirit of Jesus dying my death and being made sick with my sickness. I drifted off to sleep because I was heavily medicated and woke up about one o'clock. Teresa was there and then the church people started coming in. Everybody started praying for me. And so while I was in that condition and while I was in that state and while I was in that place of great pain and suffering, body swelled up, great pain, great suffering, doped up, drugged up. God said to me, and he came to me on multiple occasions, and God said, are you listening? God said, by my stripes, you were healed. And then he said to me, now whose report do you believe? And he came in the room a couple of times when the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It was that real. It was that powerful. He came in the room, and I heard the voice from down here, whose report do you believe? And so while I've got those tubes down my, my nose and down into my stomach, nasty as they can be, while I've got a pick line in this arm, a pick line in this arm, I got one in this neck that very day that that got infected, all that going wrong, this right side swelled up, this hand looked like a catcher's mitt, this arm looked like it was about that big, my chest swelled up to here with fluid, it was horrible, in pain to keep shooting me full of dope to keep me at least comfortable, going through that, he said to me on several occasions, by my stripes ye were healed. Remember, he has said that we may boldly say. Now, right at that moment laying in that bed, I don't feel very bold. I feel very threatened. I feel very much vulnerable. I feel like sickness has got me. I feel like that I'm being run over. But God said, by whose stripes ye were healed. And the thing I like about him, he didn't change his mind or his word because of what happened to me. Now, I want you to get this. He's not going to change his mind nor his word, no matter what your problem, your plight, your pain. He's not going to change his mind or his word. He's not going to change for you. He loves you, but he can't change for you. If he changes for you, then he would be wrong, and he can't change for you. He has said that we may boldly say. So with all, with all of the faith I could muster, with all of the heart and the energy I had, took a lot to get my hand up. I raised this hand that was big as a catcher's mitt. I remember looking at it thinking, man, I raised it up as high as I could. And I said, Father, I thank you that by his stripes I am healed. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. And I confess with my mouth, the Lord Jesus, I am saved. Delivered from this, rescued from peril and danger, delivered. Thank you. I am saved. Thank you. By his stripes I'm healed. And with that, I was saying that, sowing that, and I started doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that. I was up there 45 days doing that, doing that, doing that, doing that. But then there came a day when I got my feet over the side of the bed and I said with my heart. It, it wasn't from here to here. It was from here out of my mouth. I said, Father, I thank you today. I'm going to put my feet on the floor. And I'm going to stand up in your name. And Father, I thank you that I'm going to walk around this ninth floor here. And I got up 
The physical therapist was there, and I hadn't got out of bed in several days. He said, you sure you can do it? I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And walked around that ninth floor all the way around it once, twice, and a third time. Got back to my bed, got sat down on the side of the bed, said, I want to thank you that by your stripes I'm healed. He's standing there. What do I care what he thinks? I'm paying him. He ain't paying me to be in that sick bed. I'm paying him to be there. He ain't paying me to be in that sick bed. I'm paying him to be there to help me. What do I care what he thinks? Well, he might think you're religious nuts. So what? So what? This is between me and God. He has nothing to do with it. And I said, Father, I thank you. And he just stood there, and he was a very respectful, reverent young man. And he said, are you praying? I said, yes, sir. You just go ahead and bow your head right there, and I'll talk to you in a minute. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And I kept doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that. Didn't happen in a week. Didn't happen in a month. But thank God I was just standing there tonight as we worship, thinking about that bed and where I was and what I'm experiencing tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. See, this is not just some cheap doctrine where you lip it and grip it, where you blab it and grab it. That's what people used to say about this. This is not what this is. This is about you believing God's word with your heart and saying what God said with your own mouth because you believe what God said. This is God's word. It's God's integrity. God has said that you may boldly say. David said, I will say of the Lord. And I know I was back there in the 80s. I was in that. I was in it strong. And there were a lot of people just got off into some foolish stuff and got off in the ditch. One man told me, he said, I don't change oil in my car anymore. I said, why not? He said, well, I believe and confess with my mouth. The angels come by and change my oil. And he burned his engine up. Gee, wonder why. God ain't sending no heavenly beings to change your oil. You take it to the mechanic or do it yourself. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I ran into some space cadets out there. I really did. How many of you know what a space cadet is? Somebody that ain't got a lot of air up here, not much else. I was, <laughs> I was in a meeting one night, and this lady was serious. She turned, and she cast the calories out of the food. And then she turned to us, and she was serious. She said, now, y'all go ahead and eat all you want. There are no calories in it. And I'm thinking to myself, now, I I'm trying to be kind, but I'm looking at her thinking, that ain't working for you, dear. And I'm just going to leave it alone at that, and I ain't going no further with that. I'd be mellow. But that ain't working. If you casting your calories out of your food, that ain't working for you. Either that or you eating a whole lot of nothing. And we'll just leave it at that. But I thought to myself, and, and these people just, just, you know, that piece of pie still got 400 calories in it no matter how much you try to cast them out. Listen to me. There's some of that stuff on that table was so rich you look at it and put a pound on you. You didn't even have, you could smell it and gain weight. You wouldn't even have to eat it to gain weight. See, that, so that was that, but that's not what I'm talking about. The apostle Paul said, what we're preaching needs to be in your mouth. He says, you need to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Just let me encourage you. Keep confessing who Jesus is to you, what Jesus is to you. Boldly say things like, Christ is my life, my righteousness, my joy, my rock, my revelation, my peace, my salvation, my strength. Christ is my life. Talk about Jesus and believe and say, I believe in my heart. God raised him from the dead. Christ lives in me, and the day will come when it comes out of your heart. And when it comes out of your heart, it'll have power to come to pass. Don't get weary, don't get discouraged, don't get discouraged when you're saying and sowing. I said and 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 said. This property's paid for, this property's paid for, this property's paid for. And you know what? As long as I was saying and sowing, it was hard to keep the care of it rolled over on the Lord. But once that got down in here over the last couple of years, I watched our finances exponentially increase to where they are, and I watched this property get paid off supernaturally. I was shocked. I was just shocked at what God did, and it just happened so easy. Because when a good man from the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things to pass, do you get that? Jesus said, you're bringing something to pass out of your treasure in your heart. And when the word of God is your treasure, you're bringing something to pass. God said, listen, I've told my people they can have what I say, but my people keep saying what they have. Your confession is of the power of God and who Jesus is to you, it's the person of Christ. So what you say matters in your life. So you keep boldly confessing Jesus and the plan of salvation and the riches that are in your salvation. They are spiritual, mental, physical, social, financial, and eternal. They belong to you and they will work. You just have to stay with it. 
And I know a guy, and this is true. He went and he got, got some protein drinks and he got some protein bars and he went and took two workouts and ate those protein bars and got mad and quit because he didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He said, well, well when's this going to happen? Two workouts, a couple of protein shakes and a protein bar, and you want to look like that? Seriously? When that man worked and worked and worked and worked and worked from the time he was about 16 to 27 to look like that and stand on that stage, 11 years of grinding and gritting and, and just giving it everything he had, and you want to get it in one week with two protein shakes, a protein bar, and a couple of workouts, and you want to look like that? After you taken years of neglect to get the body you had, it took years of neglect to get that kind of body, and you want to change it in two protein shakes, a protein bar, and two workouts, you want to change it? Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Now, we're going on to the word profession. There's a little bit of difference here. And you notice the spelling there in your notes. Just a little bit of difference. But a profession is a foretelling or calling things that be not as though they were. And this is where people get afraid. They say, I'm not going to say that. I feel like I'd be lying. Hebrews 3.1 tells you Jesus is the apostle of your profession. Let me say it this way. A profession is what you do for a living. A professional golfer makes a living at it. An amateur does it on the weekend. So in one sense, this is our profession. What is your profession? Is to live by faith. I'm not talking about what you do to get, get money. I'm talking about your profession. You live by faith. You live by faith. You, the just shall live by faith. You live by faith. That's your profession. You ain't no amateur. You just don't do this on Sunday. Amateurs just play on the weekend. They're called weekend warriors. That's not who we are. This is how we live. This is my profession. Hebrews 4.14 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. And Hebrews 10.23 said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Tie that to what James said, he that wavers like a wave of the sea, let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. So now watch both Jesus and the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus make these bold professions. And remember, it's a fourth telling. In the college class when I'm teaching college, I'm not a confessor. I'm called the professor. Why? Because I'm telling, I'm speaking, I'm leading that class. I'm going forward, not backwards. I'm not even staying where we are. It would be like if I came in and said, you students take the test and then I'll teach you. And you would say, no, professor, please teach us, then we'll take the test. See, a professor is a forth telling. A forth telling. Now, this is a little bit different spin. You'll find this again in Mark 5 and Luke 8. It's a little bit different spin here. But it really shows and illustrates profession. Remember, God calls things that be not as though they were. It was amazing to me that he never did come to me and say, John, you're sick, but I've got healing for you. He only said, by my stripes, you. He never changed it. He never said anything but that. Now, verse 18, Matthew 9, 18. While Jesus spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler, this is Jairus, and worshiped him, saying, my daughter is even now dead. Now, notice this. The certain ruler came and worshipped him. So we worship Jesus and the man. Now we know from Mark's account and from Luke's account, the servant came from the house and said, she's dead. My daughter's even now dead. He knew when he came to Jesus how serious this was. But come lay thy hand upon her and she shall live. Now notice, Jesus is not there and he hadn't laid his hands on her. How did he know that? That's a profession. He's calling things that be not as though they were. You see that? You come lay your hands on her. He didn't even ask, would you come? He said, you come lay your hands on her and she shall live. See, that's a profession of faith. The confession of faith is what's already true, but the profession of faith goes deeper into the future. Now watch. And Jesus arose and followed him. It's amazing to me. Jesus got up and started following this man. 
That's incredible. Jairus' faith put Jesus on the move. Praise God, you can have a faith that puts Jesus on the move. Think about that. He arose and followed Jairus. And so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came in behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I but touch his garment, here's prophecy, I shall behold. Here's her profession. If I touch him, I'll behold. Now, she's not got close enough to touch him. She's not touched him. But she said, she said, she said, that's the profession within herself. And again, what you say within yourself. See, that's why people fail in the midnight hour. You know, Teresa, when um, I was up there for those 45 days, she came every day. But you got to remember, Teresa had, she had our big dogs at home, which, you know, the dogs can take care of themselves but they still needed some care. But then she had two big kids in the back, my mom and dad, because as they got to their last moments in 92 there, when dad, 19, when he was 93, it would have been in 2014 when I was in the hospital. And that was just a few months before he died. He became a big kid, 93 years old. He you pretty much had to do everything for him. He had to lay out the pills. You had to tell him when to eat. He had to do everything for him. So she had that obligation. So she was getting up in the morning, taking care of them taking care of the dogs, coming up there, taking care of me, come back, taking care of them. So she couldn't sit with me in the night. It would have been too much. And I wouldn't have wanted her to anyway. So that left me alone at night. And I do say this. If I had anything good to say about the devil, I'd say this. He is persistent. I'll give him credit for one thing and one thing only. He is a persistent rascal. He does not let you alone. He came every night. <laughs> he was faithful to come every night. Those voices, that torment, that fear came every single night. And in the nighttime, that's when you have your greatest battle, when you're alone. When, you, when you're alone. And see, a lot of people fail when they're alone because of what they say within themselves. She said in herself, if I but touch the garment, I shall behold. Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith made you whole. Here's some good news. If her faith made her whole, your faith can make you whole. She just tapped into what was already available. Jesus is available to you tonight. There's not a person on this planet that Jesus has not made himself available to. He is available to the tempted, the tested, the tried, the weak, the weary, the worn, the sick, the diseased, the, the destroyed, the broken, the blind, the beggar, the bound, the bruised. He is available. And if a man or woman would just cry out in faith, he will minister to them. Jesus loves broken, crying, dying, sighing humanity. He loves them with an everlasting love. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. What did she say? If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be what? Made whole. She was made whole. You see, she held fast her profession, and her profession was brought to pass. Do you see it? Now watch. And Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making great noise or making a noise. He said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead. Profession. What do you mean she's not dead? We've already got the funeral band out here. We've already went and ordered the cake. We've already went and got the food for the reception and the repast dinner. What do you mean she ain't dead? <laughs> we already got, we were prepared for a repast dinner here. We're going to bury her in a little bit because the Jews buried, you know, they buried within 24 hours. She's on her way to the graveyard right now. She is not dead. She sleeps. Man, that's bold. That's bold. That's bold beyond bold right there. You read Luke's account, the medical doctor, he said, she is not dead, she sleeps. She is not dead. Who talks like that but Jesus? And it says, and they laughed him to scorn. So they made fun of Jesus. So if they made fun of him, as powerful as he was, don't you think they'll make fun of you if you do some of these things? They'll say things about you like, boy, that guy right there is a nut. He is a nut. He gets in a recession, he'll start talking supply. He gets in weakness, he's always talking about strength. I've had people get angry with me. Don't you ever say anything but blessed and highly favored, healed and free, filled and full? Hope not. I'm trying not to. If I do, I pray God convict me and smite my heart. I pray the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in his sight. And that's what he says. Remember, God has said, listen, I've told my people they can have what I say, but they keep saying what they have. Amen? Amen. Uh, and when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. 
You see, each of these three made a profession, a speaking forth. The little woman hadn't touched the hem of his garment, but she said, think of it this way. What if perchance, and by say, you say, all right, and I've, I've used this in, in, in classes across the country, and I've had it happen here several times. If you need hands laid on you, prepare yourself to have hands laid on you. Say this in your heart. Say this. Father, in the name of Jesus, when Brother John lays his hands on me, Pastor John lays his hands on me, I'll be healed in my body. See, that's a profession of faith. When uh, Pastor John lays his hands on me, I'll be filled with the Spirit and speak with other tongues. The Spirit gives me utterance. I thank God for it. I thank you, Father. And I had a man, I had a man who had been seeking the Holy Ghost for about 50 years. Now, first of all, the Holy Ghost, you don't need to seek something that ain't lost. The Bible doesn't ever tell you to seek the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells you to receive the Holy Ghost. After Acts chapter 2, when they had to wait for him to come, nobody in the book of Acts tarried to receive the Holy Ghost. They got him instantly. You can read it again and again and again. Acts 8, when Peter and John prayed for them. Acts 10, Acts chapter 19, they received instantly. This man been seeking 50 years. Now, if you've been looking for something 50 years and ain't lost, there's probably something wrong. You think. So I sat him down, and we had a long talk, and with tears, he said, I really want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues. And I said, my brother, now I'm going to be here through Friday night. Do this. And I told him this on Monday night, and he did it. And, and several people came through the line because I'd mentioned this several times in the ministry. Listen, when hands are laid on, you believe, come expecting that you'll speak with tongues as the Spirit gives you utterance. It's released the moment that hands are laid on you. Thank God I'll be filled. Or the moment hands are laid on me, I receive my healing and disease leaves my body and I'm healed. That's your profession of faith. That's your profession. Hold fast your profession without wavering. And this man came through the line, and he said, I see. I watched those other people. I see. I, was, well, I had my cart before the horse. He said, I want to speak in tongues, then believe I had. I believe I received. You put your hands on me, and I didn't even get my hand up, but he just started praising God in tongues. I didn't even get my hands on him. It happened that quick. Your profession of faith. Hold fast your profession of faith. David said, I will say of the Lord. My profession of faith. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. I thank you. That's why I expect tonight to be the best Wednesday night. I expect this Sunday to be the best Sunday we've ever had. I, I just hold fast my profession. Sunday's going to be the best day we've ever had in Jesus' name. Why? I'm just a fourth telling. I'm calling things that be not as though they were. Can I have a good amen? So you can readily see why some people really struggle in church because their mouth's out of alignment with God. So I want my mouth in alignment with God. I want His Word in my mouth. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Look how God operates. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. All right. Well, yeah, but that's God. I ain't God, and you ain't God. True. But God said, Exodus chapter 4, write that down. Exodus 4, Moses, I will put my words in your mouth. Now, if God would do that for Moses, he'll do that for you. Oh, I pray every day, God put your word in my mouth. And listen, God said, I will be with your mouth. Then he said, Moses, take my word and put it in Aaron's mouth and I'll be with his mouth. So my responsibility as a priest is to put God's word in your mouth. I want to hear you talk faith. I want you to say what God said. And don't do it to please me. Don't do it to, to satisfy or pacify me. Do it because you believe it. A lot of people will say what I want to hear when I'm around them. I don't want to talk unbelief in front of Pastor John. Well, if you do it behind my back, you might as well do it in front of me. At least I can help you if you hide it. I can't help you. Just be honest. I'm having a struggle with my heart and my faith. I'm having a struggle. I need help. Help me, Pastor John. I'll be glad to. And then God says there in Amos 5, 14, he says, As you speak, I will be with you. And thus... We draw the conclusion, God's no bigger in my life than he is in my mouth. Add that to 1 Samuel 2, 1 and 2. You got Exodus 4 and Amos 5, 14 and 1 Samuel 2, 1 and 2. I rejoice greatly in his salvation. He hath enlarged my mouth over my enemies. 
See, when God's word is in your mouth, it's still a sharp two-edged sword, and it's bigger than your enemies. Your enemies have no defense for God's word. God's word still puts your enemies in terror and in fear because God said, and when God starts talking, everything scatters. Everything has to bow to his word. Psalms 33 will tell you that the heavens were made and the host thereof by the word of the Lord. That means every demonic force and everything out there was made by the word of the Lord, and therefore they are still subject to that word of the Lord. Praise God. So we say what God said. God help me say what God said. So stand with me in Jesus' name. Stand with me. And uh, you take a moment and pray for the internet audience while we tell them good evening and goodbye. Pray for them now. So internet family, we love you, but we're calling things that be not as though they were. I spoke over you this afternoon that you're healed in your body. You're at rest in your mind. My profession over you is you are walking into the greatest victory, the greatest blessing, the greatest joy, the greatest peace you've ever had. Your life is unfolding in Christ. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. He's revealed and unveiled in you, and you are the blessed seed of Abraham in Christ. Redeemed and filled, free, full, your foundation sure. You're God appointed, God anointed, God ordained in this generation to bring forth fruit. That is my profession of faith over you. Will you agree with that? Now, will you join me? Will you join me? Will you say it with me? Will you agree about you? Will you agree what God said is true about you? You see, God, one more time, I'll say it one more time. God told me years ago, I've told my people they can have what I say, but my people keep saying what they have. And it creates a disaster in our life. Because God won't do without, but I will. You will. So as we leave you tonight, we walk by faith and not by sight. Let God's word be in your mouth. Let God's word be your bold declaration. And I pray you receive faith tonight. It comes by hearing. Let the word of faith be in your mouth in Jesus' name. We love you. God bless you. See you Sunday, if not before. God bless you.